Well, from we, what we have heard already, uh, we can realize that it is possible indeed that uh, we are entering a new era in the practice of scientific medicine. But looking at the past and uh, the present, let me start with uh, reminding us where we are now and very schematically how what is called evidence-based medicine, that is how scientific medicine is currently working. First, we try to know the basic mechanism, molecular, cellular, physiological, which ensure a normal functioning of the organism. Then, we try to understand the mechanisms which underlie a dysfunction in a given disease. And based on this understanding, a hypothesis is suggested as a way to correct the dysfunction, for example, a drug which will interfere with the abnormal chemistry of some cells and thus treat the disease. And then, in several steps, including in general animal testing, this hypothesis is tested on humans by applying the treatment in a clinical trial to a population of patients with the supposedly same disease. And the drug is said to be efficient if the percentage of patients cured or at least improved is statistically much higher than in a control group that is a population of patients supposedly similar who did not receive the, treat the treatment. And in most cases, although there are some spectacular exceptions, in most cases, not all the treated patients are cured. But as an average, the patients who have received the drug have a much higher probability of being better off than the ones who did not receive it. And that is the evidence that is the reason why when a given patient now, a particular person, with that disease is to be treated by, by a physician, this drug can be administered with a reason, reasonable hope to be efficient, a greater or lesser hope depending on the statistics. Because this hope is statistical. This is an important point. And the trial of the drug has reached a conclusion for somebody who does not exist, a kind of average patient, not necessarily for this or that singular person to be treated. And in fact, we observe a large variability among patients in the way they respond to the same treatment. Some of them are cured, some of them are improved for a more or less extended period of time, some do not respond to the treatment or develop severe side effects. And this, of course, is where appears as an ideal so-called personalized medicine. That is, to adjust the treatment, not on a statistical basis, but on the actual mechanism at work in this or that particular organism. But I want now to question different ways to do it. How are we going to analyze the biochemistry of an organism on individual basis in order to achieve that goal? There are different ways to do it, some of them better than the others. We know today that the genome of an ind individual, that is its DNA sequence, is unique with the only exception of identical twins who have the same genes. Therefore, the temptation is great to reduce any individual to his or her genes. And since it has become easy now to analyze the genome of everyone, it is often stated that the destiny of a person, especially as far as his or her future diseases are concerned, is already written in this individual genome. But we must realize that this is a completely false belief based on the false idea that everything which happens in the organism is determined by the sequence of the DNA in the genes. And in fact, we have for a long time 
known that two identical twins with identical genes are not the same, not only psychologically, but also as far as their biology is concerned. Their nervous systems are different. Their immune systems are different. As a matter of fact, their fingerprints are different. If two identical twins have a mutation in their genome, which produces a high probability of having a disease, it is not sure that both of them will actually develop that disease. And if that is the case, one of them may develop it earlier or later in life in a more or less aggressive form than the other. And this is due to the fact that not only the structure of the genes, that is the DNA sequence, is important, but also their activity. And the activity of the genes is controlled not only by other genes, but mainly by a very complex network of chemical reactions involving all kinds of proteins, of molecules different from DNA, among them, but not only proteins. And the activity of these molecules, which regulate the activity of DNA, does not depend itself on DNA alone. Now, all these problems are only beginning to be approached in a new field of research called epigenetics, which means what is around genetics. And we may talk about it later, maybe, if there is time. And that is why personalized medicine cannot be achieved by only looking at the genome of every person. The biological structure and functioning of an individual depend on a lot more of information, including the environment, both physical, social, and psychological. But even at the biological level, among other things, the structure and functional activity of all the proteins, what is called now the proteome, should be known for every individual person in different normal and pathological states. But this is a formidable task, much, much more difficult than the genome analysis, and we are today very far away from it. Only in some genetic diseases related to known specific genes inherited in a family, genetic diagnosis may be useful for prediction and possibly for pre prevention, but again, on a statistical basis. Nevertheless, I don't want to be here a uh, killjoy and uh, spoil the hopes which we hear from the future of the medicine of tomorrow. Because there are other ways to go from the average patient to the actual individual one. So coming back to statistics, Different ways are being developed and improve greatly the transition from statistics to individuals. And these techniques are called targeted treatments, which is a better name than personalized medicine. And we have heard a nice example of targeted treatment from Professor Dina ben -Yuda. And But the general idea is to find a way to know in advance whether a disease will be sensitive to this drug or that drug in that patient or, or the, in this or that patient. And this can be done indeed by looking at the genes of the injured cells to be treated, for example, the genome of a tumor, but not the genome of the patient. This is a, an important point to be outlined. Other related techniques allow to deliver the drug to its target on the cancer cells, knowing some receptors on the membrane of the cells, which are able to be linked to this target, to this drug. After the target has been identified, thanks to genome analysis of the cancer cells, and again, not genome analysis of the patient, which is a different story. So naming is an important issue 
And talking about personalized medicine rather than targeted medicine is misleading in that it makes people believe that uh, their future is written in their genome and that by buying a kit to analyze the DNA of some drops of their salivary will tell them every future disease they can expect. So let me have now, uh, for one minute, the uh, last remark about truly personalized medicine, if it will be achieved someday, which I don't believe, and if not tomorrow, so maybe after tomorrow, or after, after, after tomorrow, it would imply the end of one of the foundations on which science is based, namely reproductibility. Observations and experiment must be reproducible in order to be treated by scientific methods. If every disease would be uniquely understood and treated for every patient, there would not be any possibility to reproduce the protocol on any other patient. As a matter of fact, this situation is already met in so-called orphan diseases. Orphan diseases are very rare disease with only a few cases known in the world. A friend of mine, who is a child geneticist, has succeeded in treating some of these diseases, but he has no way to know whether his treatment would be reproducible or not, because no statistics is possible on one or two cases. Thank you for that.